Hello, friends, and hello, my dear students. On behalf of First Timer Business School, I take this opportunity to welcome Professor V. K. Narayanan. As I had logged in, I was watching through the PPT which talked about Professor V. K. Narayanan, and I was wondering as to how I should describe him. I have known Professor and Dr. V. K. Narayanan for nearly fifty years now, but then what I read in the PPT was an eye opener for me also. In the span of these 50 years, after passing out from I am Amtapad, he has achieved so much and an achievement which most of us who've known him are not even aware of. And so I would like to describe him not as a person who trumpets his achievement, but then a really, really quiet achiever, a real quiet achiever. So kudos and a big thumbs up to Dr. V. K. Narayanan. So if I start after his graduation or post-graduation from I am Ahmedabad, the first thing he did was a doctorate uh, and PhD from the University of Pittsburgh in US, which is where he, he landed from India, he went to US, and then he didn't stop over there, he continued his learning pursuit for many years after that. And then he has held positions of importance in US in various colleges and universities. He has been a director of the Center of Management Technology, Associate Dean for academic affairs in the School of Business at University of Kansas. He has been uh, a founding dean for research in the Lebo College of Business and Deloitte and Touche Jones Tufts Professor of Strategy and Entrepreneurship in Drexel University, Philadelphia. Some of his, many of his other achievements are also there. He worked with the state of Kansas to audit the centers of excellence in the universities of uh, US, served as the chair for teaching committee and the secretary treasurer of the technology and innovation division of the National Academy Management in US, founding chair of the strategy process interest group in strategic management society, Phillips Petroleum Per Fellowship, Koch Industrial Fellowship, Fulbright Fled Chair in Management of Technology at the University of Aveiro, Portugal, Fulbright Nero Senior Faculty Fellow, and Albert Nelson Marcus Lifetime Achievement Award by Who is Who. All these achievements, all these awards, boys and girls, are extremely rare to achieve. And so you are very lucky once again in this uh, uh, line of eminent scholars who have been uh, sharing their experiences in these knowledge sessions. You, we are extremely lucky that Dr. V.K. Nairanan has agreed today to deliver this knowledge session to you. So uh, thank you very much once again, uh, V.K. sir. Please. And over to you, and uh, these students and boys and girls, they are all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I can see a number of familiar faces, but let me start by thanking the organizers, especially Professor Somani, for the opportunity to talk to you, the participants in the first Ima MBA program. Now, I'm grateful for a couple of reasons. First, and you have heard this from many of the previous speakers, some of whom I listened to, 
you represent the future. It is a truism, but it is actually true. So what I'm about to say is probably more relevant to you than many of the senior executives. Second, this opportunity allows me to provoke you to think of the future as possibilities, not as probabilities. I have been in the field of strategy and innovation for several decades. These are fields about the future. And by the end of 40 or 50 minutes or so of this talk, I would have hope, I would hope I would have gotten some of you, if not all, to think of future as something that you imagine and create, not as something that is inevitable. So I'm indeed delighted to talk to you. Now, although my preferred mode is interactive, the Zoom technology makes it a little difficult to conduct discussion. So in the beginning, for nearly about 40 or 50 minutes, let me put some ideas in front of you, and then let's follow that up with a robust Q&A session. I'm going to share my screen, so let me see if I can. Is it already? OK, share screen. Now, I have titled the talk. Can you hear me? Yes, you, you are audible. So I have titled the talk, The Age of Disruption, The Role of the Manager in the Age of Disruption, Technological Disruption. So after I gave the title of the talk, I went back and looked at the Merriam-Webster Dictionary as to what the heck they say about disruption. So the dictionary defines the disruption, and I'm quoting, a disturbance that interrupts an event. So I figured that According to the dictionary, the word disruption has a negative connotation. But in this talk, I would like to offer a counterpoint. For one, although the word hints at chaos, I would like to suggest that if you look through the lenses of science and technology and management, there is some order to this disturbance. For another, disruption is the character of innovation and entrepreneurship both of which are central to value creation, wealth creation. So just so I make myself clear, I view innovation as something positive, but I also view innovation not merely as thinking of good ideas, but bringing them to the market. Bringing to the market is for me as a management scholar, more important than just merely thinking of ideas. So for as a roadmap for this particular talk, uh, after a short introduction, I want to introduce two ideas in front of you. One is the idea of technology convergence, and I will have a little more to say about that. And the second is more speculative, and I will offer an idea called the fifth way. And I like to sketch both of these ideas and follow that up with the more important part, which is what does it mean for a manager, and most importantly, what does it mean for your career? Um, as all of you know, Pope is the head of the Catholic Church. Now, over several centuries, the church has evolved a system of selecting the Pope upon the death or resignation. The church convenes what they call a papal conclave a gathering of the College of Cardinals from all over the world, and they have to select through secret ballot the next leader of the church. Now, this process is quite complicated and can take several days. Now, in 2005, John Paul II, the then Pope, died, and a papal conclave was called, and it took four ballots and two days to elect a successor Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. Now, two days is a fairly long time, and the Italians are a fairly impatient lot, and many flooded the Peter Square facing the Vatican, listen, waiting for the announcement of the Pope, the next Pope. So what I have put in front of you is a picture of the crowd. Now, in 2013, Ratzinger decided to retire or resign, take it whichever you like, and again, as church had to call a papal conclave, that led to the election of the current Pope, Pope Francis. Now, that lasted two days also. 
And you know the Italians, they're an impatient lot and they flooded the uh, Peter Square waiting for the announcement. And in 2013, the picture of that, here is a picture and it looked like this. So what I put there is a picture of uh, 2013 and you can see what happened between 2005 and 2013, all right? Uh, this is our journey from into a digital world. So 2030, you can see all those folks holding digital devices and taking pictures of the announcement. And to a large extent, this is the world that the first time students have inherited. You are inheritance, inheritors of the digital world. Okay, this is in some ways, as far as I'm concerned, this is the immediate past that we are coming, coming from. Next slide, please. But this has been a major disruption. All right, this is described as a major disruption. And what you see on the screen is the story of a company called Kodak. Now, Kodak has been known to be one of the major camera companies. And if you ask your parents or grandparents, they will remember Kodak. I don't know about your generation, but for when I was a kid, getting a Kodak camera was considered to be a great gift. It was a coveted gift reserved for very unique moments like graduation. In 1997, if you look at the slide, and I have not put the dates, the high point of that is somewhere around 1997. And what I have put on the y-axis is really the market valuation of Kodak. And the high point is 1997, somewhere around 1997, and I put a blue line there. And Kodak had a market valuation of 30 billion dollars. That's a B, not an M. In 2012, you move forward in time and you see a red line and Kodak declared bankruptcy. And their market value, when I mean, you see the red line was $135 million, one twentieth of what it used to be. Now, what I'm trying to point out is that the movement from analog to the digital world, the age of disruption as it was called, Kodak simply could not cope with it. He, they could not adapt. Now there is an irony behind it and the irony is that Steve Sasson, who invented digital photography, was an employee of Kodak. And Kodak, even in 1976, had a patent on digital photography. Kodak is could simply could not adapt, even though they held the patents, they had the people who invented the uh, digital photography, they simply could not make the transition to the digital era. Now, Kodak is yesterday's story. All right, so let's move fast forward to today. Next slide, please. Now, Kodak, just to connect to today, Kodak had a brilliant commercial of the 1970s. It was called the Kodak Moment. So your previous speaker, Rahul Varghese, used the term COVID moment, and the word COVID moment is a play on Kodak moment, all right? So it came from Kodak's original commercial Kodak moment, and COVID moment is a play on the Kodak moment. So let's consider the COVID moment. Now, I don't know about you, but most of the people that I know, they don't like cleaning their house. So we get others to do the help. Now, it uh, happens quite often in India, and in fact, most of the middle class families have a maid, uh, maid servant or maid servants coming and cleaning the house. In the United States, we call them the cleaning crew. Uh, in most of the Western world, they call them the cleaning crew. Now, if you have a mansion or a castle like President Trump, Trump the crew may consist of 20 to 30, 30 crew members but most of the houses don't have such large houses. So we have a small, smaller cleaning house, maybe one or two or three. Now with COVID, in the COVID moment, we are facing a big problem. And the problem is we are afraid to get the cleaning crew inside the house because we are afraid that they might be infected. So we will get infected in the process. And next slide, please. So this has given rise to, next slide, please. This has given rise to robot cleaners. Now, this is a good looking robot cleaner. 
I don't have such a good robot cleaner. I mine is smaller one. It's much less expensive. But robot cleaners are now going to be in very high demand. And that mark, as the last time we looked at it, that is yesterday, their sales are going up all over the country. Uh, so this is what is happening today. Now let's take a peer into the future. Next slide, please. Uh, like many of my generation, I like to listen to rock and roll. Uh, as a teenager, I loved Elvis Presley. I loved the Beatles. These were favorites. Now, the band that you're looking at is a, US, is a UK band. They are play, a British band playing in Florida, uh, which is in the United States, as you know. Now, the service provider, the next slide, please. That's a very densely populated um, slide, but bear with me. This is a survey, a part of the survey I got from my cell phone provide, service provider. Now in the US, we call it cell phone. I know that in, the, in, in India, you call them the mobile phone, mobile phones, but I'm gonna stay with cell phone, pardon me, because that's the term that I'm most familiar with. Now, because Verizon, which is a service provider, sent me the survey, I was interested in what they have to say. And on a weak moment, I decided to respond to the survey. And they had a questionnaire of 20 items and I'm just putting up the first four ones and the first four ones caught my fancy. And they were asking me whether I am interested in certain kinds of things. The first one they said, well, you can speak to anybody across the world. Would you like to have an app on your cell phone? I can speak in Malayalam, which is my mother tongue. And you can listen if you are a Hindi or a French or a Russian, and you can hear uh, my, what I'm saying in your language translated, would you, would you like to have an app? And I said, yeah, that looks good. So I said, yes. The second question they had was, what if you can beam yourself holographically? Would you like that? And I said, of course, I love that. The third question was about autonomous cars, driverless cars, and Verizon will be a big player there providing the necessary in communication infrastructure. Would you like that? And I said, of course, absolutely. I don't like to drive. And finally, they said, would you like to have precision healthcare and where I don't have to worry about doctors and so on and so forth? Would you like that? And I said, absolutely. So I will not bore you with the rest of the 16 questions, remaining questions. But here are some first questions that I liked. And I said, of course, all of these things I would love to have. So next slide, please. Now, so I want you to look at this picture, which is the same picture as that one I showed you earlier. And I want you to take a look at it and think for yourself again. Is that really a picture or is that a hologram? I, as you can imagine, the guy who is in the middle, when he moved to the right to the left, he became a he became an image. So what you are witnessing is really a precursor to a hologram. Now I say a precursor because in 2017, from which I have picked up this picture, they could only beam two dimensional pictures and that too as a reflection. It uses a material called mylar, which is not particularly important, but three dimensional photography, holography is coming to our life. Now imagine what that can do for your life and business. Uh, Wherever you are, we can, you can beam yourself into your parents' house and talk to them as if, you are a, as if you are a real person. Or they can boom into your living room should they choose and should you permit them to. Or if you remember Professor Call's fashion industry, wouldn't it be cool to have the fashion show beamed right into your living room? Today, holography is an industrial sector estimated to be estimated to be worth $5 billion, B, not M. And this is going to grow immensely. Now, what you have seen, the three pictures that I have seen and the transitions that you're talking about is what I would call technology convergence. And it is one of the two ideas that I will use in this talk. So next slide, please. Uh, the argument that I'm going to present to you is technology convergence, we are in the middle of it, that brings about the fifth wave, an idea that I'm going to talk about a little more. And that has profound implications for our life, organization, society, and even your careers and your concept of what you are. Right. So let us spend a 
little bit of time on each one of these ideas. So next slide, please. Uh, I sketch the argument and I say we are in the middle of it. And I say that for a particular, a particular reason. When you are in the middle of a technology convergence, we really don't know all of the stuff that is taking place. So we have challenges of detect detecting what technologies are being developed, what science is bringing to us. So we have significant challenges of detection. So I would argue that any strategy now requires a technology intelligence function. Uh, I say it's prediction because predictions are going to be filled with errors, and that's okay. I would say that any prediction will have, about, for long-term predictions, will have about 70% error rate. Believe it or not, 70% error rate. The other day, I checked all the prognosticators uh, in the U.S. about future, even the near future, six months, one, one year, and uh, there is an economist by the name of Paul Krugman who won a Nobel Prize a few years ago. And he was considered to be the best predict, uh, he had the best pr track record. Believe it or not, his track record was 50%. Half the time he was wrong, right? So prediction is fraught with errors. And part of the reason why prediction is fraught with errors is there are lots of people making things, in, doing things independently and we don't have access to them. There are significant financial and resource constraints and culture and politics are important constraints on any kind of predictions. And we really do not completely know how politics and culture behave, right? So, so give me a lot of uh, margin for error when I make some predictions towards the end. That's the nature of the job. But predictions are filled with errors. So, so next slide, please. The, Next slide, please. Okay, so the plan of the talk is I will talk about the two ideas, technology convergence and the fifth wave. Then I will talk a little bit about what their implications are for the role of the manager and especially your, your career, all right? Next slide, please. Now, technology convergence is, should not be a new idea to all, all of you in India, all right? Uh, you should all be familiar with the term convergence. You are in the world of convergence. Triveni Sangama is something that you are all familiar with. It's a confluence of three rivers, uh, Ganga, Jamuna, and the now dried up Saraswati, convergence uh, of the three rivers. And if you take that from the context of rivers to the context of technology, you have technology convergence, right? So my idea of technology convergence is a really simple one. It is confluence of three technologies. Several technologies, not three, several technologies. So I'm gonna give you a framework to visualize what this convergence is about. And in that visualization, I'm going to make a distinction. So please, next slide, please. Uh, I'm gonna make a distinction between science and technology. All right, so the framework is simple. You have science platforms which are changing, you have technology platforms that are changing, and they are enabled by another set of uh, enablers, what I, what I would call enablers. Now, I make a distinction between science and technology. Science tells you why technology makes them practical. So it's a very simple idea, right? Science are the laws, but technology makes it, brings it to the market and they make them practical. So I distinguish between science and technology. And but, however, these two are very closely related. Now, <clears throat> Let us take a look at what's what are two of the major changes taking place in scientific platforms. So next slide, please. Take a look at an industry like pharmaceutical industry. Right? Pharmaceutical industry till about two decades ago was built on the basic science of chemistry. And if you walked into a R&D department of a typical large pharmaceutical company, the chemists were the kings. Chemists produced all the compounds and then they threw it out the fence and people had to figure out whether that compound cured the disease that it was targeted for. So almost all the medicines that you have seen till 2000, whether they are a tablet, whether they are a vaccine, whether they are an injection, they were all chemical compounds. All right, but the year 2000 marked a turning point. That was the year a gentleman by the name of Craig Venter announced the successful completion of a project to map the human 
genome project. All right. So next slide, please. So chemistry began to give play, give place gives its prominent place to biology. All right. Now, if you see a medicine with a name ending in MAB, monoclonal antibodies, you are witnessing a biologic compound, not a large, uh, not a small molecule compounds produced by the chemists. You may be, look for a baby. I don't know whether they are popular in, in, in India. In the US, we are allowed commercials for um, uh, pharma, uh, medicals. So we see nowadays a lot of uh, chemical, uh, pharma, uh, medical medicines ending with the word MAB. MAB is a, is a code word for monoclonal antibodies. It refers to a biologic compound. Now, this transition from chemistry to biology has not come very easily. Now, uh, so go to the next uh, slide, please. This transition, uh, you may remember a company by the name of DuPont, and it still is alive, by the way. Uh, DuPont brought us a lot of chemical stuff. Like our, uh, if you look at our house, a lot of the chemicals that you have in the house, including the carpets, they were brought to the market by DuPont. Uh, they brought they brought to you plastic plastics. They brought to you nylon, and they brought to you the now debunked Teflon, right? And I'm sure that if you have Teflon uh, utensils in your house, I'm sure that you've been told throw them away because they are carcinogenic. Dupont bought them, uh, to brought them to the market. Uh, at the turn of this millennium in 2000, they had a CEO by the name of Chad Holiday. In Chad Holiday said DuPont had to move from chemistry to biology as the base science. So in 1997, DuPont had a, one of the largest valuations in the chemical business, and he wanted to move them from chemistry to biology. Uh, in, next slide, please. Uh, pardon me. Go, pardon me, go back to the previous slide. Okay, there you are. Sorry, I'm sorry. I, I'm ahead of the time. In 2014, uh, DuPont, based on market capitalization, was the largest, was the fourth largest chemical company. Right? In 2015, they had to merge with Dow Chemicals, and now they are a struggling division in the merged company. And part of the reason is that this transition from to chemistry to biology did not come very easily. Now, on a personal note, I used to run strategy programs for the mid-level executives in DuPont. Many of them were of Indian origin. They were amongst the brightest executives I have seen. After the merger, they left the company and now they are all running their own companies, all right? So I would say that it was in some sense a success story, but they had to leave DuPont because the merged company became much smaller. My point is this transition was not easy for the pond to make. So let's go to the next slide. Another th change that is taking place. A, another change, a second change that I, I consider important is taking place in psychology. Now, when I was in the MBA program five, 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 uh, 50 years ago, I guess, uh, when somebody mentioned psychology, we thought about Freud. So you can see the picture of Freud on the left side of the uh, left side of the slide. And I had two professors, and I'm sure some of your faculty members who are my colleagues, they also remember these names, uh, Kamala Chowdhury and Pulin Gurk, they were Freudians, right? I had a summer project with a gentleman by the name of K.K. Anand, and Professor Paul will remember him. He was a Freudian. Freud was the, uh, the central figure in psychology, and when we used to think about psychology in those days, we thought about psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis was the basic uh, building block of psychology. Uh, however, I must tell you uh, that we used to make fun of these folks. We used to say that they practice what we call the talking cure. That is, we sat, sit on a couch and we continue to talk, we talk, we continue to talk, and lo and behold, we find a way to a cure. So it is, we used to make fun of them as folks who practice the talking cure. But nowadays, and the next slide please, Nowadays, psychology is being supplanted by 
the newer field called neural sciences. And neural sciences scientists are telling us stuff that we did not know about ourselves. Let me give you two examples. Uh, the first one is from aviation. Uh, there is a uh, there is a group of aircraft called high performance aircraft. Sometimes when pilots fly high performance air aircraft, they suffer a condition now we now know to be G lock. G for gravity, lock for loss of consciousness. Now G lock creates functional impairment and this requires a prolonged period of performance recovery. Well, don't be alarmed. Most of you won't be flying in a high performance aircraft. Air, fly, air, uh, flight, air transport is still the safest form of transportation. You won't be flying, you will be flying only commercial in, in commercial aircraft, not in high performance aircraft, unless you decided, unless you decide that you want to be a pilot. For a long time, G-Lock was considered to be a mental condition caused by stress. But we now know it is caused by the differences in gravity and the differences in the levels of oxygen that is pumped to the brain. And this was, we can simulate that now in the laboratory on you if you want. And with the help of instruments such as near infrared in spectroscopy, which are the tools that neural scientists use. And if you ever go into a uh, magnetic MRI, you, if you have to take an MRI scan, you are seeing a product of neural sciences. So this is one, first one is from um, aviation. I will give you a second one, which is closer to home, closer to managers. One of the more disturbing things neural sciences are showing us is that we all have, human beings have lizard's brain, all right? So when we make very high stress decisions, we make decisions based on gut, not on all the analysis that you will learn in your uh, management classes that I learned in my management classes. So beware when you go into a boardroom, your lizard's brain is likely to take over and therefore you need to create routines to prevent the lizard's brain from taking over. Neural sciences is now showing us how the lizard's brain is alive and well in all human beings, including some of the most sophisticated psychologists. Uh, but, next slide, please. Now, these two, these two disciplines, biology and neural sciences, they are converging. And that's a natural convergence because both of these are human related. So evolution is now coming to a point where biology and natural neural sciences are good, coming together. And this is opening up fabulous opportunities for innovation and entrepreneurship. And I'll come to that in a moment, but let me give you another example. Go to the next slide, please. Now, the scientific platforms, as I said, they tell you why. Technology makes it practical. So, Things that you see in the marketplace are the results of technological developments. So let me give you a couple of examples of what is going on on the technology front, right? Uh, let's go to the next slide. If you, I'm sure that all of you have heard about uh, Henry Ford. He's the guy who gave us the automobile called the now uh, infamous Model T, right? Uh, he's the symbol of, he's the guy who created mass production. Uh, he's reputed to have created mass production. Uh, ma you will learn about mass production. Uh, one of the earlier management theories was uh, built around mass production. A uh, gentleman by the name of Fred Fred Frederick Winslow Taylor uh, talked about scientific theory of management. He talked about, he built up the theory by looking at mass production and auto assembly lines. Now, Henry Ford, had famously talked about mass production. And there is a quote which I would like you to listen to. I picked it up from his biography. You can go Google him and you will find this. And here is what he said. Any customer can have a car painted any color that he wants, so long as it is black. Okay, so that was his concept of mass production. Now, if you walked into a Ford Motor Factory in 1960, this is what you will see. 
All right. Fast forward to 2020. Next slide, please. This is what an automobile assembly line will look like. And you will see there are hardly any humans. Just like in the case of the cleaning crew, we are automated away human beings and we have put robots in place of human beings. All right. Uh, a second revolution is in place. Go to the next place. Uh, next slide, please. I'll skip that. Skip to the next one. A second revolution is taking place in decision making. And as you will note from the cartoon, even now, it, most of the decisions, many of the major decisions is made at the gut level. So don't be disappointed. They might ask you, when you begin to work, a senior executive might ask you to put together a wonderful report. You spend hours on the report and you hand it over and you will say, I will look at it sometime. It happens to consulting firms all the time. They produce wonderful reports and unfortunately they gather dust on the shelves of many of the executives. They don't have time to read it and they wind up making decisions by the gut. All right. So go to the next slide, please. Now, this form of decision making now is being replaced by artificial intelligence. And I'm sure that one of the previous speakers, your director, talked about his interest in artificial intelligence. So obviously, he's telling you what the future is going to look like. Now, you must have all heard, seen the movie Moneyball. And it starred Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt is considered to be one of the uh, sought after actors in the United States. Moneyball is the story of how artificial intelligence, one of the, one of the storylines in the Moneyball movie was how AI techniques or the earlier versions of our AI was used to select baseball players and how baseball teams made a lot of money using this AI te statistical techniques, precursors to artificial intelligence to select players so that they can make a lot of money uh, in, uh, by running the, uh, running, running the team. All right. So artificial intelligence, uh, decision making platforms are just like robotics is replacing human beings. Artificial, artificial intelligence is re enabling decision making by putting the decision making on a much more rational level. All right. Let uh, fast forward now. Next slide, please. Okay, go, go to the next slide. Let me go to the next slide. Okay, so these two sciences and the uh, technologies are now coming together. So you can visualize a flow where a robot may make a decision based on artificial intelligence that will send signals to the roboticized factory floor, and therefore you probably won't need as many human beings as you need to. Now, this is not fairy tale. I won't be surprised. In about five to ten years, you will be living in a smart house. What will a smart house look like? A smart house will look like the following: some of the elements that I can talk about. It will auto. It will be auto cleaning. It will have a refrigerator or place where you store things where you really don't have to make all those decisions. When the inventory runs out, the uh, the the refrigerator will let the supplier know, and the supplier is a robot and will deliver the stuff to your house. You don't have to worry about it. It will come, open your refrigerator, store all the things, and you probably can spend your time watching a movie or listening to the music or creating a novel or whatever else you are interested in. This is a vision for the immediate future. This is upon us. I think there are a couple of houses I've seen at pictures of it where they have now shown this as a possible uh, possible smart house for the millennials to pick up and, and they're expensive for the millennials to, to rent. All right, fast forward, uh, go to the next slide, please. Go to the next slide, please. All right, go one more, one more slide. Okay, now to make this happen, we need to have several enablers. So I'm going to talk about four enablers very quickly. Uh, one is called precision manufacturing. A second one is energy. I want to spend a minute or so on energy. I want to spend a little bit about information display and computing technology. So go to the next slide, please. Uh, I want you to do an exercise. Please close your eyes. Take about 10 seconds, not more than that. And imagine or estimate, not imagine, estimate the width of a strand of your hair. 
right? You can already realize, I'm not going to ask you what your estimate is. And uh, uh, I, you can Google it and you will find that the, uh, the, uh, the width of a strand of hair varies anywhere between 17 to 180 micrometers. A micrometer is about a thousandth of a millimeter. And they say that the Europeans have thicker hair than Indians. I don't know whether that is true or not. I don't believe it. But be that as may, the variance is between 17 to 180 micrometers. Now consider a nanoparticle. A nanoparticle is 100,000 of a strand of your hair. All right, 100,000 of a strand of your hair. Now don't worry if you get lost in these small numbers. I don't, I get lost in them all the time. I can't visualize what a nanoparticle is. Nanoparticles are quite pricey. Again, as a point of reference, if you want to have a gold nanoparticle, it is about $80,000 per gram. Now compare that to a raw, a gram of raw gold, that's about $80, $80 per gram. So you can see how pricey these nanoparticles are. But these nanoparticles are very, very important in the modern age. Even if you want to do some experiments in physics, they are built on nanoparticles and you're finding a lot of stuff Probably, you probably won't be aware of it, but you are going to get a lot of products built on nanoparticles. They're going to be high investment oriented, but they are coming. They are, some of them are already in the market and I'm pretty sure some of them are available to you in, uh, in India. All right. <clears throat> so go to the next. So precision manufacturing is about how you can focus your manufacturing to make such precise entities. So I go to the next line, and this is about visualization of data. Another technology, another enabler of the new world that we are coming into. In the old day, currently, and even in the old days, we used to think about computation as something, we used to think about data as something as numbers. So, you know, you get all these reams of data from the computers and we analyze it, so on and so forth. And as you have seen, and many of you might have seen this as the result of AVRs, the more important developments in data visualization is coming from audiovisual. So go to the next slide, please. So if you are a biology person, you can touch and feel, you can hear. So the audiovisual forms of data are much more useful to spark our imagination, whereas the quantifiable data is not as good. They don't spark our imagination as much as audiovisual data. So there will be a lot more visualization of data in the form of audiovisual presentations. Go to the next one, please. Uh, believe it or not, we will need more energy in the coming years. And I saw one estimate, which is an underestimate, I would think, uh, and that is that in by 2030, the world will consume 50% more energy than it is consuming now. That may be true, but I suspect it is going to be much more than that. And the Western media, if you follow the Western media, they will blame India and China for this increase because India and China are developing fast and the Western world say, oh, the energy, uh, they are consuming a lot more energy, forgetting the fact that they have done this in the past. All right, that's another story, that's a sidebar, but be that as may, energy needs are going up. Now, I will say that the 50% estimate is an underestimate because we are now at the threshold of space travel. Now, a trip to the moon right now costs about $20 million. Right? And there are folks, private companies, putting money into space travel. It used to be about 200 million about a decade ago. When I used to work with NASA, and NASA used to put up these shuttles to go to the moon, it's very bulky, uh, uncomfortable travel. I never travel space. I'm afraid of traveling by space, into the space. But it used to be bulky and it used to cost a lot of money, 200 million plus. But now the cost has come down to 20 million. And believe it or not, many of you, first I am on, MBA students, in, I would suspect that some of you will be engaged in space travel 10 years from now. So this is coming. So the energy sources that we will need, it will be far more than the 50% increase. So we will be diversifying our energy sources. Next slide, please. So we will have a diverse set of energy sources. We will have the kind of energy sources we have. We will be looking now, but we will be looking for additional sources of energy. That's coming and this is, these are being developed. 
these are being developed just as you and I are talking about. And finally, last slide, please. Computing is shifting. Now, I have put pictures there. One on the left, you have seen the mainframe, and the other is the quantum computing. On the left, you see mainframe. This is the computing technology that I grew up with. Many of your faculty members have grown up with. And it used to be staged in large spaces and uh, used to be put in uh, huge buildings. We hated mainframes, by the way. But we are now coming at the threshold of what they call quantum computing. Right? Now, on the light, you see a quantum computer. It is really actually a chandelier hanging down from a living, a living room. Some of you will have this chandelier two, two, three to five years from now. This has far greater computing power than the mainframe, all right? It was uh, last week, uh, two weeks ago, I was in a conversation with World Trade Corporation. We were having a conference and uh, I, we, they invited a couple of people from Exim Bank, Export Import Bank, which is a agency of the federal government, US federal government. And they were talking about the amount of money going into quantum computing. Right, so they're developing quantum computing. So in about two years, quantum computing will be marketed very widely, both in the United States and perhaps, perhaps globally. Now, as I said, quantum computing reduces energy needs of computing by a factor of about 1,000. So it reduces energy needs, number one. Number two, it speeds up computing very much. Just to give you an indication, a quantum computing can do what a laptop that you have can do thousand times faster. So it can shrink up. Thousand is probably an underestimate. So when you put AI applications online, it can do the calculations in uh, seconds, what it requires a lab, your laptop to do in a lifetime. So quantum computing not only reduces energy consumption, but it is also going to speed up, and that speeding up is going to enable AI applications to be much more widely adapted, adapted in such a way that you won't know that you're using an AI. So it could be a farmer, it could be a little kid using AI, they won't know they are using AI because it is built in into, uh, built in into, the, uh, into the world, that they, into the lifestyle that they have. So, Go to the next slide, please. At the end of it, what I'm trying to tell you is all these developments are leading us to a point in time. This technology convergence is leading to a point where two things are predictable. One, all human motor activity can be robotized. I don't think we need to do any work, physical work. Second, most of what we think as cognitive work, that is decision-making, can also be automated. All right, that's where science and technology developments have taken us. So with that, I'm going to the next idea, which is the fifth way. All right, go to the next slide, please. So let's go to the next slide, move on. Fifth, fifth way, so well, that's fine. Now, fifth way, we said play on words, and it is a play on words because there is a gentleman by the name of Alvin Toffler, writing in 1970s, talked about three ways. He's the one who coined the word wave and I'm building up on, the, on his idea in some sense. And his three waves are as pretty much simple now to understand. He said, he wrote a couple of books, by the way, uh, many books, not two couple of books. One of them was called Future Shock. Every one of us read that, every one of my generation. It will kind of leave, it will kind of look, if you folks try to read it, you will kind of find it boring because he was making predictions uh, and for you, they are part of your life. So what he talked about then, what uh, Alvin Toffler talked about then was three waves, agriculture, which was uh, based on farmer and land. And we were in industrial age, so it was based on a factory worker, capital and urbanization. And he was predicting the in, in onset of the information age, which he said the major worker is a clerk, it is based on data and it is based on telecommunication. So he talked about three waves. Right, and that was a book uh, prediction that he made. Of course, it has come to pass. All of us, you are all living in the information age, perhaps the cyber age. And what I'm going to do is to play on his concept of wave, and I'm going to talk about the fifth wave. 
So go to the next slide, please. Uh, now, wait a minute. Some of you may be thinking, you skipped the fourth wave. What happened to the fourth wave? No, 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 I counted it right. I'm talking about the fifth wave. I didn't use the word fourth wave because there is a competition between two groups of play people for the ownership of the term fourth wave. One of them are the biologists who claim that the world is we are moved into is the biological age, and there is an argument going on that. And then there is another group of people who are saying, oh, we are now in the green age because of all the climate change and all that. And there's a huge debate between those two groups of people, the biologics and the green waves. I didn't want to get in the middle of that wave, so I skipped, the, skipped that uh, debate and moved straight into the fifth wave. So that is why I'm talking about the fifth wave, not the fourth wave. So my point is very simply this. Uh, the te science and technology developments have moved us to the fifth wave where we can characterize the outlines of the fifth wave. Uh, we have come leaving behind a world where we were suffering from material scarcity. We are now going into a world of material abundance. By the way, Steven Pinker, a professor at Harvard had shown, he produced enough data to say, say that we now have enough food, enough clothing, and enough housing, potential for housing in the world that can take care of the entire population. Okay, so we are, according to him, already in the world of material abundance. There are distribution problems, but be that as may, we have enough to feed, to clothe, to house the entire population on the planet. So we are moving from material scarcity to material abundance. As I pointed out, most of us don't have to work. So that means that we will have a lot of leisure. We don't have to wait, delayed gratification. We can gratify our needs and desires immediately. And you know how fast the laptop, we are now impatient even for one second when we look, in, when we look at the laptop. And instead of looking for a good lifestyle, we probably will be looking for multiple lifestyles over our lifetime. And so I would say that we will have to think more about ourselves, which is what I call the shadow self. So in a sense, we have come into a, gone into a, we are going into a world which is very different from what we are and a lot of what we have learned, we learn to manage our scarcities. In fact, economics, the dismal discipline is consist, considered to be the discipline that talks about allocating scarce resources, right? So that is a world that we are leaving behind us and we are going into a world of material abundance, leisure, immediate gratification and all the other stuff that is associated with it. This is what I call the fifth wave. Next slide, please. All right, so I can put together a, a set of vague outline of what the fifth wave will look like. First one, it is laid over the previous wave, so the other waves are not going to go away. This will be built on top of those earlier waves. It is going to be global. Make no mistake about it, instead of all, the, in, in spite of all the stuff you hear about nation states and nationalism, the world is going to be global and there is going to be global uh, concentration of fifth wave because some of the rich countries will get there faster. There will be global, a fifth wave in India and I'm pretty sure it is going to be confined to some of the tier one cities. And the third point that we can make is that some of the institutions that we have built up to support us in the world of scarcity, that is going to disappear. I'll say a few more about that in a moment. And in the fifth wave, the class structures, you heard about class structures, the upper middle class, lower middle class, and all that kind of good stuff or the bad stuff. Uh, traditional societies have class structures or separations built on either income or caste or race. In the fifth wave, the class structures will be based on time and exclusion. Let me say a little bit about that. What I mean by time is class structures will be built on who gets to see this first and who gets to see the second, third, fourth. Right? That's one form of class structure. It's also based on exclusion. Who is included, who is excluded. Now, I'm pretty sure that you heard the term cancellation, right? You're on social media, you get canceled, which means that if you said something bad or something that a group of people didn't like, you get canceled, you're kicked out of the group. So this is going to be a common phenomenon in the fifth wave. But I would like you to pay a little more attention to the red character, and that is, we will be forced to architect newer and newer forms and newer variety. So the fifth wave customers are going to be looking for 
perpetual variety and perpetual newness. That has implication for management. All right, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Go to the next slide, please. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about the implications. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the key. Next slide, please. Okay, before I talk about the implications, let me say a couple of things. I would submit to you that when people talk about the age of disruption, they're really talking about the fifth rate. So I don't call, consider this as disruption. I consider this as exciting. And I consider this as exciting because this age of age provides, makes entrepreneurs and innovators the most important people in wealth creation. So you're moving, I would submit to you, moving into the fifth wave where innovation and entrepreneurship are going to be the keys to wealth creation. But remember, when I said innovation and entrepreneurship, innovation especially, I don't mean just generating ideas, but bringing them successfully to customers. So this is the word we need innovators because they are going to hold the keys to wealth creation. Go to the next slide, please. I'll go through this quickly. I won't spend too much time on that. What that may, uh, first implication, broad implications, if you will, ex experience generating products will be important. And they will have to, they will yield temporarily high returns. So the sustainable competitive advantage you will hear in your strategy classes is a thing of today. It is not going to be valuable tomorrow because tomorrow's competitive advantages are going to be temporary. Uh, a lot of innovation will be borderless. That means it will be global. A lot of the work will be Uberized. And those are two implications for work and uh, products. The third one is probably not important for India but it's important for the United States. And that is that we, United States built up its nation state around the concept of the welfare state. It was built in 1930, that is obsolete. The next one is probably in, important for India. Global political structures will undergo fundamental transformation. And you know UN, right? All of you think about United Nations, but think about United Nations. It is the reflection of the decisions made by European imperialists. And look at the Security Council. India has to work its way to become a permanent member of the Security Council. In 20, by 2025, the three major powers will be United States, China, and India. Whereas United Nations is a reflection of what European imperialists did at the end of the Second World War. So that structure has to change. And a gentleman by the name of Parag Khanna of Indian origin I think he got his PhD in Georgetown. He's, I think, now in Singapore. He has written beautiful books on this, uh, 2003, 2000, I mean, 2014, 2013. And he's in Singapore. And maybe one of these days, you should get him to come to you by Zoom. And finally, I would submit to you the fifth one, which is probably the most important one I'll spend. This has significant implications for the role of manager. That's what you're training for. And for your life. So go to the next slide, please. Now, again, 60,000 feet, managers are going to be shepherds of innovation. That's going to be the central task of the manager. And secondly, what that means for you, it will have implications for your wealth, work, relationships, and self. So let me spend a little bit of time on each one of this. Next slide, please. Now, in the past, so I'm going to talk about the first one, which is the shift in the managerial role. In the past, we thought of managers as a take charge artist. Now, at least in the United, United States, the business press approvingly talks about tough managers, tough bosses, right? And even now, there are business journals like Fortune, which publish annually the 10 toughest bosses to work for. Now I said, uh, he, because all of these bosses that I have seen today are men. And part of the reason why all of these are men is that many of these leadership models are built on men who are the leaders that these business press reveres. So they prefer to revere people like Genghis Khan, the toughest possible boss you can think of, but they would have nothing to say about either Jesus Christ or Lord Krishna, whom, because they are not tough, tough enough in the, in the business press. So this business 
leader that we portray in the business press as the tough boss generally has certain characteristics, right? First of all, he's a directive leader. He's a take charge artist. He gets the job done one way or the other. He's an analytic thinker. He breaks things apart and analyzes them. And most importantly, he views employees as a resource to be used, to be deployed. I would submit to you that in the age of innovation, we need a different type of leader. And the opposite, the characteristics that I put on the right, first one, he's going to be a team builder. And when you listen to Meru Setna's talk, he talked about team building. And that is going to be a very important character of the innovator entrepreneur. He has to, she has to stimulate innovation, not be an innovator by herself or himself, but he has to stimulate innovation in others. The third thing that I would submit to you, and this is going to be very important for managers going forward, if not in the past, he, the managers, he or she will have to think holistically. They must be able to put things together, not merely split them apart, but they must be able to put them together. And finally, they need to begin to view employees as partners and owners in the enter enterprise. So they're going to view not employees not as resource to be used, but as partners in their undertaking. Now, in both cases, we always talk about, and they are still important, they are probably more very important, customer focused and investor oriented. So I won't say many more about that because it is true for in, in both of these uh, in both of these eras. So I'm going to suggest to you fifth wave requires entrepreneurs, innovators, and managers who can do that. All right, so that's a big uh, sh uh, implication coming for the fifth wave, coming for the managerial, managerial role. And now I want to spend a little time on the slide that you have been waiting for, and that is, go to the next slide, please. Uh, what does it mean for you? Now, if you think the fifth wave is going to be a reality, one of the things I would encourage you to think about is that you are an entrepreneur and therefore think of yourself as a firm. So the first and perhaps the overarching implication I'll put in front of you is that you need to think about yourself as you Inc or you private limited. You are the entrepreneur, you are a firm. So what I am going to say in the next few months, moments is what does that mean in terms of three or four items, right? Uh, wealth, work, relationships, and career. So go to the next slide, please. So I'll start on the left side and work my way to the, uh, work my way to the right. The first thing that I want to offer you, all right, is about wealth. You are going to be wealth creators. If you're a firm, you should be creating wealth. Now, as you either have picked up or you will learn in your, uh, in your classes, and Professor Jayati Trau has talked about it in his talk when he talked about accounting as a cruel, a firm has a balance sheet and an income statement. And I put a couple of more things, insurance, because you're talking about you, Inc., and you, Private Limited, and a will in case unfortunate event, unforeseen, unexpected event of death, you need to have a will. So here is a task that I would set for you. If you're an Inc., if you're a firm, you're an entrepreneur, and you have learned all the stuff in the next, you will learn all the stuff in the next two years, set a task for yourself. At the end of the two years, at the end of the first IMA program, one of the things that you should have is you should have a financial plan for yourself, which will include a balance sheet, which will tell you what your net worth is at the end of the two years, which will tell you what your in income streams look like, what your cost structures will look like, have some insurance to protect yourself because you're individual and have a will because you are a human being. All right. This is a plan that you will change annually but you should have a financial plan at the end of two years, if not now. And let me tell you one other thing. Be very proud that you are very well, you are well creators. There is nothing so much more economically valuable to society than wealth creators. So you're going to be very proud of creating wealth because that's what you will be doing as a manager. Uh, about work. Now, in this world, things are changing because we are going to look for, we are in the pursuit of newness. So continuous learning will be central to your work. 
you will have to continue to learn even after you get out of first IMA. Just think about first IMA as giving you the initial lead in this learning process, but you will probably will need to continue to learn. And this is something that I hope that I'm pretty confident that you will get pounded into you during your, uh, during your program. I'll put a couple of more things. Uh, just let me give you an example of this before I talk about a couple of more things. Uh, some of you will hear, some of you have heard about a major consultant by the name of Tom Peters. He was a McKinsey consultant. He has written a number of books in the 70s and 80s. Some you may get to read about them. They are still valid, by the way, although they were written in 70s and 80s. Tom Peters used to tell this to his folks. When he used to come for talks to uh, firms, one of the things he used to say to the folks in a firm is this. Folks, take a look at your CV. Uh, every two months, look, go back and revisit your CV. Ask yourself the following question. What have you added in the last two months to your CV? What new skill, skill, skill sets have you put, can you put on your CV in addition to the new projects that you've done? I would submit to you that his advice to the employees 20 years ago is valid even now. So continuous learning, keep updating your vida, both in terms of skill sets as well as in the knowledge that you, that you acquire for yourself. Then I'm going to say a couple of things which may, be, uh, which may sound funny to you, but it's important. In your first job or in your job after Foster IMA, look for demanding superiors. I said demanding, not abusive. Okay, I'm not talking about abusive people. Don't avoid them. Abusive people, avoid them. Demanding superiors. Demanding superiors expect 200% out of you, and in the process, they will get you to be better managers and they will teach you more. So look for demanding uh, superiors. If you are a, if you have a like a superior, and if you have the option, avoid him, avoid her they are not going to be useful in your career. That's a tough thing to say, but I, I, I will have to say that out. Uh, a third thing that I want to point out is a lot of time, you think you're doing a lot of work. Let me assure you, what you need to learn is to learn to work smart, not to learn to work hard. So there is no percentage in working 24 hours. That should not be the criteria by which you judge yourself. You should ask yourself, can you do this very well in the shortest possible time, in the best possible way? Work smart, not work hard. All right. And of course, you have to be globally oriented. The world is global and you need to develop your information base, etc., etc. And that's something that you will hear from all of, all of the folks that you listen to. Uh, I do have a couple of more points, which are probably the more important ones. One is about relationships. Relationships are really the keys to success. And I would say this, I know that you will hear a lot about this in your classes, but I will say this, the current word is network. I think network is the fancy term now, all right? But let me say this, uh, I suspect when I talk to the folks, folks that I deal with here in the US, network is an abuse term. So if I talk to a individual who is 23 or 24 and hear them repeatedly say, hey, oh, I have a networking session today. So I ask them, what the heck are you going to do? He said, well, I'm going to hit the bar and have a good time. Now, have a good time. That's absolutely right. But networking is a professional term. It's a serious business. Networking is building relationships which are built on trust and reciprocity. Trust, because you can trust the people, they can trust you. Reciprocity, because it is a two-way street. Right? So networking is serious business. So just to put some meat into it, uh, network will consist of people, and I put a couple of examples. Go to folks, mentors, and sponsors. Go to folks are people go to, you can trust, they give you answers, they give you information, just as you will give them information, uh, you are trusted, and you probably can give them some advice here and there. Mentors, you need teachers. You need te teachers, far more number of teachers than you in your classroom or your superiors. So you need to develop a set of mentors. And finally, sponsors, they're the ones who go to finance your projects and your new firms. And finally, and here, I know that you've heard this before, but I want to make one important point when I think about you, when you think about yourself. 
I know integrity is important. Absolutely. Integrity is the brand, is the primary determinant of your, of your brand. So if you sacrifice integrity, you've lost it all. So integrity and brand. I'm sure your faculty members are, they'll drill this into your head. Your parents have drilled this into your head. So I won't speak more about it. They're important. They are the most important things in your life. But let me speak a couple of more things. One uh, that is items four and five. And I think they are probably the most important things that I tell you. You're going to be in a very stressful world. All right. Your world is going to be stressed out just like our world is stressed out. And fifth wave in, will induce a lot of stress. Spend some time for yourself. Spend some downtime for yourself. Spend some time for yourself. I call it that downtime. Spend every day, spend five minutes, spend 10 minutes, just by yourself, alone. And don't let that time be interrupted by your parents, your children, your spouse, your professors, whoever. Spend, then spend some downtime for yourself. It is the greatest antidote to stress-induced diseases. Spend some downtime for yourself and make it a daily habit. And finally, and I'll say this, I'm 70 years old. The most, uh, when I look back, one of the things that I have always thought about is when I look back, the times when I have not done well, and I, I don't regret most of my life, okay? But the times when I have regret is when I have not listened to my heart. When I have listened to my head, I have made great decisions. But looking back, when I have regrets is those times when I made a decision purely on the basis of my brain at the expense of my heart. Listen to your heart. That will keep you young. That's the one that will keep you young. That's the one that will keep you entrepreneurial and innovative. So next slide, please. In the immortal words of Steve Jobs. Next slide, please. In the immortal words of Steve Jobs, the former CEO of Apple, stay hungry, stay foolish. I've taken a little more time than I should, but let's go have some question and answers. Thank you. Okay, I have a question from, given that, let's see, first two, given that disruptive technology had gained marvels for humankind and absolute revolution in many industries, do you think it will be the same for our generation, fight against pollution? Do you think that a, that, that will be a disruptive technology for that or it's far into the future? Uh, I think we will conquer pollution. I'm very really bullish on that. Okay, as you can see, I'm a techno optimist, so I tend to think world in optimistic terms. We will conquer pollution. But the more important question to ask is how will we conquer pollution? And if you think about fifth wave seriously, we can take two or three paths. And I don't know where we will land up on this, okay? One path is where we will think about the globe, the world as our, uh, as our habitat, Vasudhaiva Kudumbagam, as India used to say, and think about pollution on the global, global level. That's a possibility. That can be achieved now. With the technologies that we have, that can be achieved now. It, so it is, the lack of a political will more than technological feasibility that is preventing us. So I said, culture and politics are difficult to predict, so I can't tell you. But the fifth wave is problematic because it can create a dystopian future. And that's the danger that I see, and I hope it will not come to pass. That's the danger I see when I see the developments in space travel. Some of us who are going to be part of the fifth wave are generally going to be the richer of the rest of the world. We can easily decide that we want to save ourselves and leave the world behind. And that is a future I hope will not come to pass. In both the scenarios, go global control of pollution or a dystopian future, the technology is available. It is the lack of a political element that is preventing us from doing so. All right, so that will be my quick answer to your question. Let me go to another question. Is evolving technology destroys the jobs or create new ones? It's a good question, and I'll put it to you in two ways. Uh, a lot of demagogues will say technology has destroyed jobs. That is demagoguery. If you look at the evidence, technology create, kills jobs, but it also creates jobs. 
In fact, the evidence, economics evidence is that technology creates higher value jobs by making lower valued skill sets, repetitive jobs, repetitive tasks being conducted by auto, being automated away. So the evidence to date is that technology creates more high paying jobs. That said, I think a more important question will be, why do we have to work at all? Can't we do live our life the way we want to? Now, I have a professor of mine, a colleague of mine, he retired three years ago, and he used to be one of the most prolific scholars. He's considered to be one of the leading psychologists in the world in the, in the discipline of work and family. He retired, so we used to have lunch, we had lunch. The last time he had lunch, he told me, you know, you know, we came, I'm doing stuff what I wanted to do. I'm not writing any papers. So I said, Jeff, what do you mean? You love writing papers. He said, you know, I wrote those papers because I wanted to be seen as great, great psychologist. Now I don't have that pressure. So I'm doing what I want to do. Wouldn't it be nice if technology takes us to a place where we can do what we want rather than do things because we want to earn a living or we want to be known in a particular field, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think that is also possible. Again, it is a matter of political wealth. Steven Pinker, as I pointed out, says we have enough in the world to clothe, to house, to feed the entire population. But there is a problem of distribution. And where is the distribution coming from? It is because we are unwilling politically, globally, to take decisions needed to make the resources more distributed. All right. So that's my quick answer. That is, again, a quick answer to a very important question. Let me see. Oh. In what ways can holistic thinking help us? A lot of the projects that you will do will require holistic thinking. That is, after baking things apart, you have to put things together. A project will, project will require you to think holistically. Now, uh, there is specialization and then there is coordination. When you need holistic thinking is when you are coordinating. And mass managers, you are going to be coordinators, all right, more so than merely functional specialists. So holistic thinking is the way to think about new enterprises. Holistic way is to think about going to the future. Holistic way is the way to think about what the next product should come from, where it should look like. Holistic way is the basic way of thinking about a business plan. So holistic, think will, uh, holistic thinking will enable you both in your work as well as in your life. Imagine what your life is, and that is a holistic exercise. Okay, let me see if I can see. Can you suggest some good books? My God, I can give you so many good books. I don't know where to start. Uh, I'm a strategy innovation guy. So let me see. Uh, there is a book which was five years ago, which came out, it's called Dirty Rotten Strategies, written by one of my professors. That's the first one that comes to my mind. There are lots of good books. Uh, you talk to your professors, you, I can see many of them right there. I go to school with them. They probably widely read, probably better read than I am. So you ask them, they will give you more books than you ever want to read. All right. I'm not shirking the question. I'm just giving you a better answer on which you can act. Okay. How can AI take over decision making completely? All right. It's a great question. It was, I was planning to do that, but in the interest of time, I avoided it. So let me give you a couple of examples, couple of, one personal experience, okay, about AI. This was last year, 2019. Um, it was a Sunday evening. It was in February, Sunday evening. I was in Philadelphia, where I work, and I had a 40-mile commute to my home from where I'm speaking now. So it was in the evening after dinner, I was driving back. And when I'm driving back, it is boring driving back. I switched on the, the radio channel that I was listening to. And I was listening to a debate. And the debate was between two, two entities. And I'm using the word entities very carefully. The first one on the debate was a guy by the name of, I think, Harsh Natarajan. Last name is Natarajan. He's a, of Indian origin. He's Oxford educated. He, is, he works in a major financial uh, firm in UK. And he was considered to be one of the world's leading debaters. Right? The other debater was an AI. 
It was purely an AI program created by IBM. So I said, oh, this should be easy, right? So I was listening to the um, 50 minutes debate, driving the car, and you can find this debate on the internet, by the way. I don't know whether they've put the whole debate. It's about 50 minutes. So I was driving and listening to the debate, and I was rooting for a human as opposed to AI. And at the end of the debate, they did a poll. And to, great, to my great relief, the, when the poll was done, the human won the debate. All right? They put two questions in the poll. One of them was, who won the debate? I'm glad that the humans won. But there was a second question, which is, who did you learn most from? And believe it or not, the audience, which was in New York, voted the AI program to be better educator than their old human. So I reflected back on what was the difference between the two, the AI and the human. And one of the things that I, on reflection, I discovered, it may be wrong, but what I discovered was that the AI was much more factually based, whereas the human was invoking feelings. So if you go back to the Greek, uh, Aristotle and Plato and talk about speaking, public speaking, the great quality that the humans brought into the debate was that he could talk to my heart, not to my head. And that's probably one of the reasons why he won the debate. My bottom line is this, almost all decision making that we claim is decision making can be built up as a series of repetitive tasks. They can be automated. Where we come in as human beings adding value is where we can talk about our humans and feelings and values. AI systems don't have them yet. So yes, AI can automate away a lot of the decisions in organizations. So we have now the next wave of uh, uh, next wave coming. Uh, the 70s and 80s were considered to be flattening of the organizations. AI will further flatten the organizations to an extent that we have not witnessed before. Right. Uh, let's see. Let me go one other question. What do you mean by saving time and exclusion? All right. I'm not sure which slide you're referring to. Saving time, I said in two places. One is when you say work smart and work hard. That's saving time. So let me give you an example from my personal experience. When I ran the business school in Kansas, uh, it was an interesting job. I, about after six months, it got boring. All right, and I, I, I don't like to be bored, but I, let me explain to you an experience of mine. So in the first two weeks, I had a dean's office and I had a separate faculty office. I didn't want to lose my faculty office. I had two offices. So I used to come, I had expected to come to the dean's office and sit there. And I used to have a team of people. And one of the ladies was one of the smartest ladies I've ever seen in my life. She used to come to my office every morning. And second day onwards, and she used to come and she used to chit chat with me and she used to ask me questions. Sir, uh, do you think that I'm going to buy some chairs? Uh, do you think that it should be black or navy? Okay. So first day I said, oh, it should definitely be black. I was stupid enough to give an answer. By second day, I, I got wiser. She came and said, uh, we have a lot of env envelopes. What size should it be? And I said, uh, Arlene, what do you think it should be? So she said, we have these options. It should be 8 into 11, 10 into 11. So Arlene, you're smart enough. You make the decision. All right. She made the decision. It was probably the best decision, better decision that I can. What I did then, starting the week after, was I didn't show up in my office in the morning. Arlene was a morning person. A lot of the, my team members were morning people. I was not a morning person, so I, gave, I had an excuse not to show up. What I discovered was that things got done, things got decided far better than I could have done without my being there. In fact, my being there was a hindrance to the decision making and I am supposed to be the dean. So I could do away with all those presents and people were checking out whether I like the stuff they made. They should not be asking me, they should make making the decisions and run with it. All right. So I was doing a lot of idiot, idiot work, scut work. It is something that I should be taking away from my work workload because then I can focus on things that I should be focused on. And that is what, my, what I mean by smart work, All right? That's smart work. So when you are going to in a corporation, when you work in an organization, or even if you are starting your firm, 
you probably will need to delegate and trust the people that you did delegate the stuff to. That's one simple way by which you can reduce cut work and you can do smart work. All right, I think there was another question. What okay, I think uh, one last question, yeah. yeah. What's, uh, I think there was, a, there was another limit to the time and exclusion. I'm not sure what I meant by time. You save time by doing smart work as opposed to cut work. Okay, exclusion. You find more, more and more forms of exclusion coming up. And I would submit this, and I, don't, I didn't mention this uh, when I was going through the, your stuff, but I think we have come to a world where you have to be very, very careful about your social media presence, right? I don't put myself on the uh, Facebook. By, I have an aversion to Facebook, but you guys will have to deal with social media far more than my generation. And therefore your presence on the social media, you will have to monitor very carefully because the cancel culture that is very popular in the United States is based on, based on exclusion. That if somebody doesn't like what you said on the Facebook, they can kick you out of a group. That is the cancellation culture. And so I think that is, a, that is your presence in social media is something that you will have to monitor very, very carefully. All right. Uh, I think that is the last question. Uh, okay, uh, BK, uh, great hearing you. Uh, of course, uh, you said a lot, and I think it'll take time for a lot of us to really assimilate and to correlate with our lives and all that. But all of it was definitely very relevant because we are, as a society, as a country, as a planet, are really at a cusp uh, where, where we are seeing dramatic changes and this will continue. So let me start by thanking you for opening our eyes and uh, making us look uh, a little more differently, a little further perhaps. Um, I'd also like to say that um, I would like to, um, uh, I still remember our, uh, you know, uh, we haven't physically met since uh, I am Ahmedabad, which was many decades ago. Uh, and I still remember very fondly um, uh, from the heart, uh, really our trek to Pindari Glacier, which is in the Himalayas, Head of Nanital, and as you said, we humans, these human feelings and other things will always out, out, outweigh more, uh, a lot more than a lot of the computations which uh, today uh, uh, automation can do better than us, perhaps. Um, I won't attempt to uh, summarize everything that you said because you said a lot, but I'll really uh, mention some of the points which uh, really appealed to me and which I think. Uh, sort of stood out uh, uh, starting first of all what I liked about your presentation is that you are an optimist you're an optimist all the way and that's what we need to be and um, uh, although disruption usually means something negative but disruption need not be negative disruptions is positive and we should see this phase as being positive and we should embrace it in fact uh, we should perhaps uh, worry less about what the disruption would be. And this is mankind's sort of always try uh, peek into the future and trying to predict what will happen. But because the changes, as you mentioned, are happening so fast and the disruptions are so this thing, and uh, our accuracy is at best up to 50%. So we should really forget about that. And we should try to create a world that we want. Uh, that would be more effective than trying to predict and trying to write with it. Uh, because the tools are in front of us now, we can do, we can make, we can change the world now, perhaps much more so than uh, 30 years ago or 40 years ago. And uh, of the many examples that you talked about, perhaps the, uh, to me, the most exciting was about holograms. Uh, let's say just five, six years back, we could be talking across the world uh, on Zoom like this with about 200 more students. And as you said, just round the corner is really a, a meeting where you can have holographic people. Uh, holograms are already there. Tomorrow's classroom, perhaps uh, uh, students don't have to come to class because their hologram will be sitting in a seat and they'll be able to see all other uh, students uh, who are also uh, holograms 
and yet they can converse almost as if they were there. So these are some of the startling new and I think very exciting and dramatic changes that are going to happen. Um, so uh, what are the most important characteristics today? Uh, uh, what is, uh, so, so this effort to uh, create rather than to predict means that we, uh, what is at premium is our imagination. What is at premium is entrepreneurship. And that is really uh, at the crux of the whole thing. And as you call, and which is I'm hearing for the first time, and of course, something of great interest is really the fifth wave. Uh, up till now, we have been, let's say, the third wave has been up to, uh, we have been uh, in an age of information, but now we are just about entering the fifth wave, which will be even more dramatic as far as its changes. But the changes will be positive. What it will do is break down a lot of the institutions that we have taken for gra uh, granted, like the United Nations or even governments or even the caste system or other, because they are no longer be relevant. They, uh, also, instead of having a few pillar points where everything sort of uh, gravitates, the whole systems will be dispersed, which actually is very good because it uh, it, it empowers each one of us much more than what uh, you and I have been empowered 10, 15, 20, 30 years back. Uh, so, uh, so this empowerment is really very exciting. And um, you mentioned a lot of details, and I'm sure if uh, some of the students want a copy of your presentation uh, to think through this in more detail, perhaps this can be provided. Uh, but uh, in, 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 in uh, final summary, what does it mean, uh, your advice to students in this fifth, uh, in, in this fifth wave, what should they be looking at? There are five or six points, I'll just repeat that before we uh, finish off. Uh, one is continuous learning. So uh, that is why when uh, you students go to your uh, company, uh, the most important thing is not the salary you're going to get, how big fat the salary, but how much can you learn of that company? Because that will be much more valuable than any amount that they will give up. And then you'll, of course, keep on learning. Uh, you need to work smart. I think we all understand uh, wor uh, working smart. We need to be glory, uh, globally oriented because um, practical reasons, the borders are going to disappear. Ideas will travel fast, which as they already are doing. Um, important thing is to network. Um, it is good to have mentors because these will, will be will give you the strength to really uh, face the future. Uh, you need to have sponsors, especially for projects and other things. And lastly, not to forget that you're human and that downtime is important. It's important still to listen to your heart. And as far as we know, there is no machine in the horizon which will uh, take that over, even if everything else does. And with that, I would like to thank you once again for a very exciting look into a very positive uh, future that we that is going to come. Okay, I will urge the students to stay back, and uh, as we do, continue with the polling that takes place after the talk. Uh, uh, that will start now. Thank you. Uh, thank you once again.